on. So for example, this rehearsing future conversations or past conversations is something that people with inner speech do a lot. And I do it a lot with my inner speech, for sure. Especially if I have a difficult conversation ahead, like an, an argument or something. But people without inner speech don't do that at all. And I really, I'm really curious to see if that has any consequences as well. If you would like to support the efforts and research we are doing here on this podcast, please go to podcast.discoveringyourmind.com and become a monthly supporter. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Aphantasia is a condition characterized by an inability to visualize mental images in one's mind. If you have just discovered that you or someone you love has aphantasia, or if you're just fascinated by the subject in general and love learning more about it, you are in the right place. The Discovering Your Mind podcast delves into all aspects of the mind's eye, including aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and everything in between. Welcome to the Discovering Your Mind podcast, brought to you by ShanesBrainDomain.com. I am your host, Shane Williams, also known as Shane's Brain. And today we're talking with Johanna Nethergar, who is a researcher at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and I am super excited to have her on the podcast today. Welcome to the show, Johanna. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, to start out here, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your credentials, and the type of research you're involved in? I have done my PhD on inner speech, generally, how people talk to themselves in their minds when they're going through something a bit boring or difficult, and then the newest research I've done is on people who say that they don't have any inner speech. And I work in cognitive science, so it's all about trying to understand how language works and how the mind works, and trying to go at it from a sort of experimental perspective. Okay, very cool. So what brought you to my attention was I came across uh, an article, a publication entitled, Not Everyone Has an Inner Voice, Behavioral Consequences of Anendophagia. So that's generally what I'd like to talk with you today about. Mm -hmm. So where did the term anendophagia come from and, and how do you define it? We as a field have been aware for some time that there are people who say they don't have any inner speech, but there hasn't been a term for that experience. So we decided to sort of test these people empirically for the first time, and then we found it useful to have a term. So we actually developed it in collaboration with people on Reddit, people on the subreddit for Aphantasia, which is the experience of not being able to generate uh, mental images. Right. Um, so there's a lot of, because these two are related to each other, not having inner speech and not having inner images. So there's a lot of people with an endophagia on the Aphantasia subreddit as well. So we went and proposed different terms to them, and I discussed like whether they found their experience reflected in these terms or not. So we had other terms that were about like having a quiet mind, for example, but they didn't like that because it doesn't feel quiet, it feels very busy, um, but just without the experience of inner speech. They also didn't like terms that implied that there was no language going on at all. Some of them did, but most of them said that they experienced words or concepts, um, but just not in the form of, form of voice with sound qualities and articulatory qualities. So having discussed it with them, we settled on this anendophagia, which means without inner speech. And we define it as the subjective experience of not having an inner voice that you use in your everyday life like most people do. Most people experience having an inner voice that they use to talk through their plans and help them remember what they have to buy at the grocery store and help them regulate their own behavior and motivate themselves. So the way I think about it is I can recognize that it's an inner voice and not just thoughts because I can, for example, identify which language I'm speaking to myself in, in my head. And it also sort of unfolds over time the way uh, spoken out loud language does. 
And I can also, if I'm rehearsing a conversation with somebody, a conversation that I've either already had and I'm trying to rerun it to see if I could have said something in a smarter way, for example, or a future conversation, then I can hear if it's my own voice or the other person's voice that I'm uh, practicing conversation with. So that's the kind of experience that these people with an endophagia do not have. Okay. So what I ask a lot of people is it is it like actual hearing? Can you actually hear the voice or is it more just like a thought type of mm. a thing? So is that what you mean by that? Like if you if you don't have an inner voice, does it just mean you can't actually hear your thoughts? Yeah, that's part of it, right? So there's this auditory and articulatory properties of speech um, that I experience and that most people experience when they experience an inner voice. But of course, there's more to language than how it sounds and feels when right. you speak. So we we still don't know if there's anybody who does don't have any internal language activity <laughs> at all. Like if they have inner speech but don't hear it, because that's very, very difficult to test. Right. Um, very difficult to uh, distinguish words from concepts, if that makes sense. But we yeah. can kind of get an intuition about it from thinking about people like uh, congenitally deaf people who sign to themselves in their minds as well. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've been that, curious about that. Yeah. Um, me too. There's very few studies on that, but it does seem to be the case. So obviously that's a different format of talking to yourself. Um, right. It doesn't have any of the speech properties. So there must be something that these two have in common, sort of. That transcends modality, as it were. Yeah, that's interesting. Because how I would describe mine, it's really hard for me to describe it, but you know, I don't hear anything at all. My my thoughts do sometimes I'll think in words, maybe I'll think a sentence or something like that, but it's not, you know, it doesn't feel like it's in my voice and it feels very distant and very quiet and very vague. Mm. So it's almost, it's almost nothing, but it's something. Mm. Anyway. So how do you know, how do you know that it's words and not just concepts? Well, yeah, that is hard to dis discern. I would say it varies between the two. Mm. I would say sometimes it's definitely just concepts, but then other times I would say that it, it does form in words depending on what I'm thinking about. Yeah. But again, all of it is, is kind of mysterious mm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So this, I don't know if you have heard about this method called descriptive experience something. It's this uh, method where you have people walk around with a beaver and it beeps at random times during the day. And then they have to sort of try to report exactly what's going on in their experience at that time without any presuppositions about what it should be or what format it okay. usually has or something like that. And then you, you do that for a while and you're interviewed by some trained experimenters that make sure that you're not like saying that it's in a speech when it actually wasn't just because that's easier to report, for example. Right. And doing that kind of thing, we usually find like five types of experience. So inner speech, inner seeing, feelings, sensory awareness, and unsymbolized thinking. That feels like thinking and concepts or thinking and ideas to me. So it's clearly like a widespread phenomenon, but very, very difficult to approach <laughs> scientifically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all of this is so hard to pin down because... <laughs> We can't see in each other's minds. Mm, so uh, exactly. the best we can do is try to describe it. Where and how did you find the participants for your study? So we recruited more than a thousand people online, simply from, from a campus population in Wisconsin and uh, from Amazon Mechanical Turk. And then we gave them this questionnaire about how they experience their thoughts in their daily lives. For example, one item could be I think about my problems in the form of a conversation with myself. And then they just rated how relevant that felt to them. Or I enjoy using mental images to reminisce for visual. And then we recruited the ones that had 
least in a speech and most in a speech of those thousands. And then we ended up with roughly 100 people. So it seems like it could be maybe 5% or something that have an endophagia, maybe less. And that, I think, is equivalent to aphantasia. So that's what we did. Our primary goal was to test if this complete subjectively reported experience has consequences for how you solve specific tasks because nobody had done that before at that point. And actually in philosophy and psychology, people have been very skeptical and still are of this phenomenon of being like, maybe they just mean something different when they use the term in a speech. Maybe they're just confabulating, but I don't personally think that's very fair. <laughs> right. The yeah. same thing has happened with aphantasia as well. Lots yeah. of skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think it's just more interesting to take it seriously and see how far we can get towards understanding these differences in experience. So we gave them some tasks that we thought, okay, if there's anything that they're going to be different at, it's something like verbal working memory, for example. So remembering words that sound very similar in order in your head. <laughs> if you don't have auditorily represented in a speech, that's going to be difficult. And we did actually find that they were significantly worse at that. So that was really interesting. And that's also something that since this paper came out, a lot of people have emailed me, a lot of people with an endophagia have emailed me to say that they, they're very happy that this is being researched and they, like, they can relate to the results for the most part. So that's nice. And then we also gave people some images that they had to judge whether they rhymed or not. So, for example, a picture of a house and a picture of a mouse. And then they had to say, do these two rhyme or not? And thanks to English being weird, um, <laughs> you sometimes have words that, uh, right. that look, look different but still rhyme, like phonologically. So that meant that we could check that they're not just visualizing the words. So there's something that seems to indicate that people with an endophasia have that sort of differently represented language at least okay so we're talking about the rhyme judgments right that you talked about in the, mm. in the article what was the first one you talked about before the rhyming one that was the one where we gave them five words that they had to remember in order and some of them sounded very similar and some of them looked very similar um, so it's very difficult to recall them in order and they were actually they were worse at both recalling them in order and recalling them regardless of order. But we also asked, and this is not in the article because there wasn't space, but we also asked people what kind of strategies they used. And that's really interesting. So so this could be like P, friend, boat, book, brain. These They are not similar, but that would be sort of what you had to do and then recall them in order. And some of them said that they uh, constructed a narrative from the words to remember them. Um, okay. So that's a way of getting around using your inner speech to do it. <laughs> or they visualize the things, or they just remember the first letters of each word, which also kind of to reduce the memory load. I think it's interesting how you can, how many different ways there are of actually completing these tasks, and how right. that's also not usually something we take into account when we do research. Right, because everybody's mind is different, so they're they're just going to solve it however their mind mm. works, yeah. which could be a million different ways, really. Mm. So would you say that most of the people without an inner voice also have aphantasia? Is there a link uh, there? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're positively correlated. If you don't have inner speech, you're also more likely to not have inner images. But it's not... It's not like 100% correct. Right. For, for most people, they are. So that's also why we could find so many people without inner speech in the aphantasia subreddit. <laughs> so in the study, you had people on the low end of inner speech and also on the high end, right? Mm. So when you tested the people on the higher end with an inner speech, was, was it hard to diff differentiate whether they were solving these problems with their inner voice or with their visualization as i mentioned we asked them what kind of strategies they used and okay. um, 
it seems like, or at least they reported using their data voice to solve them. At least these two tasks, so remembering words that sound very similar and doing rhyme judgments in your head, uh, the, the best way of solving them is using your inner voice. And another thing that was really cool was that we also asked them whether they had said the words out loud, either because they were at home, right? So we couldn't stop them from saying the words out loud. But we asked them, <laughs> did you say these words out loud or did you name these images out loud when you had to make the rhyme judgments? And for the people without inner speech who did that, they were just as good as the people with inner speech. So they, they, they were completely able to make up for the difference. Right. Which, which really is, indicates to me that that's the inner speech, well, the verbalizing it is making a difference. Right, because once you can hear it, it's easy to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right. So we've talked about rhyme judgments. We've talked about verbal working memory, right? Mm-hmm. What about task switching? What is that? Right. So um, we did two more experiments, which have previously been related to inner speech. So task switching is where you use your inner voice to cue yourself to remember to switch between two tasks. So in this case, it's between adding and subtracting three. So it's very simple. You go through a list of numbers and you have to switch between adding and subtracting three. Other studies have shown that People say like plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus to themselves in their heads to remember the order or remember to switch. So we thought maybe people without inner speech are going to be worse at this, but they were not at all. (laughs) They were completely the same. So that also tells me, so there's nothing phonological. There's nothing about the sound of inner speech that helps in that case, like there was in the rhyme judgment and verbal working memory experiments. So there's, there's tons of ways of achieving that in different ways. Like one of them said that they had externalized it by tapping their index finger to mean add and their middle finger to mean subtract, sort of on the table next to them. So they used that to cue themselves instead. One of them visualized a cartoon character going thumbs up or thumbs down, alternating, or think of the concept of adding and the concept of subtracting without saying it to yourself. That was also very interesting to me that we didn't find any differences there. Yeah, that is interesting. I keep I keep trying to think about how I would do and something like okay. that. And that one feels actually harder to me hmm. than the rhyming and the memorizing one does. Hmm. So how do you think you would do it? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. That one feels a lot harder to me. Hmm. So if I understand it right. And and maybe that's part of the problem is that maybe I don't understand it right. So you're saying switching tasks from adding or subtracting three? Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. So it will say like 23, and you have to remember to subtract and make 20. And then it was like 46, and you have to remember to add, so it's 49. And then, you know, you just go through the list, and it's random numbers that you have to add or subtract three to. Right. And you have to do it quickly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, I think I understand why I'm struggling with it. Mm. It's because it's math. <laughs> and, and whenever my brain confronts math, it shuts down. It says, nope, I don't want to do it. Right? <laughs> so that's what I'm struggling with is, is every time I try to start doing it, my mind just does not want to do it. Mm. It's like, why, why are we doing this? It's, yeah, so I think that's why that one is harder for me. I see. Because my brain just doesn't want to go there. I have to give that more thought. All right. What about same slash different judgments? What's that one mm. all about? So that was the last experiment and also the one that's most difficult to explain in my experience. <laughs> so we showed people very simple silhouettes of cats and dogs, different cats and different dogs, like silhouettes. And then they had to judge whether they were the same or different. So they saw two at a time and they had to judge as quickly as they could. And we were interested in, there's this effect in the previous literature. If you see, if you're asked to judge whether they belong to the same category or if you're allowed to judge whether they are identical to each other. So if you're asked to judge whether they are identical to each other and they are not, but they belong to the same category, you are slower. That slows you down because it's dog one and dog two 
and they're not Ivan's goat, but they're both dogs. So you kind of you experience some interference from the fact that they belong to the same category. Some people attribute that to the fact that language has this concept dog, and we want to put things into this category of dog, and we want to ignore the finer details of different dogs, roughly speaking. And when you have to make that judgment very quickly, you're distracted by the fact that they're both from the same category. So we thought maybe people with less inner speech will be less affected by this if it is a category of language. And it's also what they very often tell me is that they experience language as sort of limiting, limiting their natural way of thinking, which is more abstract. And if they have to put their thoughts into words, they experience that as sort of effortful. And like they have to get rid of a lot of details. Oh, so man. I could imagine that they are thinking more outside of categories and things like that. So that's what we were trying to test with that experiment. But again, there were no differences between the groups. They both had this category effect, actually. But they were not different in how much they had it. Okay. So and that could mean two things. <laughs> it could mean many things. But I think the most, two most likely candidates are that they actually have internal language still but just not the sound properties and movement properties of language. So you have, to, you have the word or the concept dog, and that influences your thinking, even though you don't hear D-O-G. Or it could mean that just everybody grows up with language all around them, and <laughs> these, we, we interact with these categories in our daily lives, so maybe it's not, not uh, even related to inner speech, maybe it's just we, we get these categories automatically into our cognition from interacting with the world and talking about dogs to other people and stuff. Things are pleasant in the little town of quiet until Mal Beezer discovers he's allergic to his own sneezes. Blending wit and humor with lively imagery, The Endless Achu is a delightfully clever tale. Available on shanesbraindomain.com and Amazon. I think the, the most important result is that these uh, subjective reports had measurable consequences. That's not at all a given. So that's something that we're really excited about. And then these, these differences between the different tasks that seem to indicate that it has more to do with the sounds of an inner voice rather than sort of internal language activity. I think those two things are really important. And then this, this effect of uh, saying the words out loud, that, that sort of cancelled out the difference between the groups. I think that really uh, underlines that we, it was, we did target the right uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I also think we gave them everybody some questionnaires and there were also some really interesting differences there that I haven't talked about yet but that I would really like to uh, continue working on so for example this rehearsing future conversations or past conversations is something that people with inner speech do a lot and I do it a lot with my inner speech for sure especially if I have a difficult conversation I had like a, an argument or something but people without inner speech don't do that at all and I really, I'm really curious to see if that has any consequences as well. So it could be the case, of course, that that means people with inner speech are somehow worse at having conversations because they don't practice it as much. Um, right. But I think we would notice that. Well, I am worse at conversations. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't do that? You don't rehearse I don't do that. We actually just barely did an episode, uh, my son and I, about uh, disorders. We talked about that when it came to social anxiety, because he has an inner voice. And so he said, I do that all the time. I'll play out conversations. And if I feel like I'm going to end up being embarrassed or something like that, I'll decide not to engage in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me if I, if I ever have anything like that. And I mm -hmm. don't at all. I never, I never play out conversations in my mm -hmm. mind. That's an interesting thing when you talk about, you know, consequences. He said that his inner dialogue causes him anxiety, mm. right? So we decided that that could be a consequence or maybe a plus for me where I don't have that internal dialogue. And 
the other thing that it that it helps me with is is just staying at peace mm. kind of getting to that place of just calm and and peace inner peace and and quiet yeah. i feel like it really helps me in that regard as well because a lot of people's inner voice from what i've talked to people is it can be annoying or it can be critical or intrusive or you know a lot of a lot of things that mm. i don't really struggle with in that way because my my whatever it is my my thoughts again are are very distant and vague and they're not very front and center for me yeah that's also what uh, i get a lot when i talk to other people who don't have any speech and they're like that they can almost can't believe that there are people who have it almost all the time <laughs> And somebody, somebody talking to them or multiple voices having discussions and berating yourself constantly or trying to encourage yourself constantly. They think that sounds really frustrating and annoying to have one. So does your inner voice ever shut off? Can you turn it off? If I'm doing something with my out loud inner voice, that makes it shut off. And that's also something I've taken advantage of in my experiments. So if I've wanted to test the role of inner speech in something. I've given people a verbal task to do at the same time. So if you're like, if you have to count out loud, for example, or something very simple like that, it's very difficult to talk to yourself at the same time <laughs> because they kind of rely on the same resources. So that can make it shut up. But I don't, um, I know there's a lot of those sort of meditation techniques that are also about trying to get it to quiet down. But that's never really worked for me. So I have to distract it with something else. Okay. So is it difficult for you to fall asleep because of that? It can be. It depends. So if I'm tired, I also have less control over it. If I'm very tired when I have to go to sleep, then I will do this uncontrollable inner speech where I'm rehearsing all these conversations and trying to plan what I'm doing tomorrow and all that stuff. And that can get, make it difficult to sleep. So your inner speech includes other people's voices. You can hear their voices as well. Mm. But only if I'm, it's not like they're talking to me and telling me what to do, which also happens to, to some people. But um, it's only if I'm rehearsing conversations with them. Conversations, right. Yeah. Speaking of downsides of rehearsing conversations, for example, you can also imagine that if you're rehearsing conversations all the time, that like your son, you would avoid having him in real life, if you think you're going to be embarrassed, for example, or that you could be less spontaneous or less adaptable when you have the actual conversation because you've sort of already run it through so many times that you think you know what's going to happen. So it's, not, it's, not a, it's again not a given that people without inner speech will be worse at conversations. <laughs> it depends how, you, how I'm going to measure it, I think. Right, right. That is a good point because I have a friend of mine who talked about that. He said that he runs he runs all the conversations through and then he'll skip the conversation because he feels like he already knows how it's going to go. Mm. And he's like, that's not fair. Like, I don't know what they're going to say. But <laughs> but in his mind, he's uh, he's predetermined that. Mm. Yeah. Which, which I can't relate to at all. So that is interesting. <laughs> Just a couple more questions about your own about your own inner voice. Mm. When you're reading a novel, for example, and there's, you know, all these different characters, do you assign voices to them as you read? Like, can you hear like unique character voices? Yeah, I think so. When I read fiction, when I get really into the story, I don't, I'm not conscious of reading at all. It feels like it just comes straight. The story just comes straight into my mind without the intervening Really? I keep decoding the writing. If somebody asks me, what would this sound like if you read it out loud, then I can do that. But that's not what it feels like when I'm really into it. So in that sense, like, I both see everything that's happening and hear the voices of, of people talking in the story. You hear all the sound effects as well, like if a gun went off or a door slammed, you hear all that as well. It's not so vivid that I would ever be in doubt about whether it was in my mind or outside of it. Um, right. But it is, I do experience there and some kind of auditory 
As far as the visual aspect of it, I'm assuming you're you're pretty familiar with with those terms as well. Mm. Where where do you fall on that scale? Would you consider yourself like hyperphantasia? I think I'm probably in the top half of being able to visualize. It's not very like some people say that they visualize every detail of something. Like they have a very, very detailed image of whatever it is that people are normally asked to visualize, like a red apple or something. If I try to visualize a red apple, for example, I can't see all the details of the entire apple, but I can zoom in on different parts of it, so that like the stem or whatever. And then I can see more details. I have a more detailed experience of that when I zoom in than I do of the whole object. Okay. But I don't have this, like, I don't have very intense mental imagery. Would you mind if I just ask you a few more questions about that, and then we'll get back to your research real quick. I want you to imagine a horse in your mind. Is it like looking at a picture or more of just a thought or something else? How would you describe it? It is like a picture. I know what color the horse is. I don't know what kind of uh, markings it has. I also know it's not like just a sort of textbook drawing of a horse. It's in some kind of mood as well. <laughs> I have a lot of experience with horses, so I can't <laughs> imagine okay. a horse without imagining how it's doing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. And also sort of vaguely where it is, but it's not very clear to me. Just that there's grass, but not otherwise. There's no background or anything. Okay, so it's pretty isolated for the most part? Yeah. Okay. Can you add more background to it if you want to? Yeah. Is the image still or is there movement happening? There's movement happening. The horse is, uh, is throwing its head. The colors themselves, are they kind of, are they vibrant or are they more muted? Muted, I would say. Is the image more clear with your eyes closed or your eyes open? Eyes closed. Is there a big difference? Mm, no. Would you say you see the horse in your mind, or is it more like it's projected out in front of you? In my mind. So is it solid or transparent? Let's start to switch between seeing what I'm actually seeing with my eyes and seeing, <laughs> seeing the horse if I have my eyes open. Mm, solid, I think. Is it 2D or 3D? 3D. Can you rotate it and see it from all angles? Yeah. Can you make the horse run? Mm-hmm. When it comes to the the inner voice associated with the horse, as it was there, could you hear it as well? Could you hear it moving, or if it, you know, made a noise anyway, could you hear that as well? Mm. And was that automatically attached to your visualization, or was it optional? It was optional in this case. I was imagining it standing, sort of uh, standing and moving around a bit, and I didn't automatically hear the hoops on the ground, but I can conjure it up. All right. Very cool. So let's talk about the reliability factor. How reliable do you think these people were and the research as a whole? I think it's definitely one of the limitations of this kind of study that we rely so much on subjective reports. Also, the kind of questionnaire we gave them is much more reliable to do what I explained earlier with the having people report in the moment what their experience is like rather than having them report what they usually do or what they did last week or something because it, it's very difficult for people to remember and they very often say something that sounds plausible some preconception they have of what their experience is like because most people are not used to thinking so deeply about it <laughs> in that sense like that's definitely one of the weaknesses but then again, our study was all about the subjective experience and trying to test it, test whether it had consequences. So it's both a weakness and just sort of a, an unavoidable part of this kind of experiment. But we do see that at least people respond similarly across different t- types of questionnaires and across time. So if we ask them again, they will ask, answer similarly a second time. So that they so like they just change their minds from one month to the next. So that's also a, a plus for the reliability. I also really um, appreciate this response I've gotten from people who have been emailing me and telling me about their own experience. It really helps me understand what it's like 
not to have Venus Beach. And most people can relate to the results. So that also tells me something about the reliability. Yeah, it sounds to me like you've you've really thought it through and we're very careful about what about this and what about that and mm. yeah it sounds like the research was was very tight in that way you you really made sure you thought about all those different variables and mm. and what they mean yeah we tried at least <laughs> yeah i thought you did a very good job at that honestly thanks we've already discussed this a little bit but i i want to see if you have any more to say about it. Are there advantages and disadvantages to having an inner voice? Most people who have it say that they use it for uh, to remember things and plan their lives and self-regulate and motivate themselves. And that's also what I found in my other experiments, that you actually benefit from talking to yourself for motivation and focus. And that seems to be something that inner speech helps with. It's still unclear whether you can reach the same kind of benefits through other means. I would guess you can. I think there are definitely some downsides regarding this uncontrollable negative in a speech. Most people experience that sometimes they ruminate too much with their inner speech, for example. This is also one of the key symptoms of depression and anxiety that you, you're constantly telling yourself like, you're, you're pathetic, you're no good, nobody likes you. Or if you rehearse these conversations, that people will, whatever you say, people will have a negative reaction. I think that's for sure also one of the reasons why people always ask me how they can turn their inner voice off. <laughs> because we have this experience of it not being helpful sometimes. And as you say, like it helps you reach a peaceful place that you don't have it. I think a lot of people would actually envy that another downside i think is that if you encode things in language you lose some other details because language is limited in what it can represent it can represent a lot but in terms of visual details for example like you said visualize a horse and all of the concept of horse is encoded in the word horse but it doesn't have it doesn't say anything about what color it is or how big it is or what it's doing or what mood it's in, you know? So if you're given a lot of different, <laughs> a lot of pictures of horses and you will later have to remember them, it's going to be difficult if you just like label them horse, 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 because okay. you kind of get, get rid of the more detailed information that way. Um, okay. So that's also what, what we can see in experiments that there's this phenomenon called verbal overshadowing for example. And people test this by giving participants a video of a burglary, and then they have to write down a description of the burglar, or not. And if they've written down a description of the burglar, they're actually uh, worse at identifying them from a lineup later. Really? (laughs) Because they've, they've overwritten, they've verbally encoded this visual information that they had, and it's smudged the details. (laughs) <laughs> that's really interesting one of the rabbit holes i wanted to go down at some point on this podcast is the idea of reliability in witnesses mm. and in, with people with aphantasia if they're more or less reliable witnesses there's some evidence that it's easier to remember things if they're uh, easy to label if they're easy to give a verbal label then they, it's easier to remember them later and most people in our, our condition takes advantage of this. But it's not an advantage if there's no verbal label or if you have to remember things that are quite similar, but they would have the same label. So like, if you give them the same label, then you're not going to remember the more subtle differences. Okay. I understand that better now. That's, yeah. That is re- very interesting. Mm. That's something I had never heard of or thought about before. So thanks. Mm. That's, that's cool. Yeah, so we haven't tested that whether it's sort of an automatic effect for people who have a lot of inner speech and maybe people who don't don't have that effect and they're better at remembering these uh, finer details. But I don't know. It, it's a hypothesis. All right. Let's talk about some of the other areas of study that you're interested in looking at in the future. So we already discussed this, the 
or with people who have a lot of inner speech rehearsing conversations a lot um, and people who have little inner speech not doing it at all <laughs> and that's a pretty big difference and it feels like it we should be able to test that somehow so that's one thing i really want to look into and another thing is this very very tricky distinction between having an inner voice and not hearing it or not having it at all right so in most of our experiments we rely on language having sounds like spoken language having sounds because that's sort of easy to target in a lot of ways but it's much more difficult to distinguish soundless words from just thoughts or whatever you would call it so i have a few ideas on how to do this, but they will have to rely on the fact that different languages represent things differently. The order of word, the order of subject, object, and uh, verb are different in different languages. So if you like ask people to describe things in their minds, they will do it in a different order if they're doing it with their spoken language, even though they're not representing it with sounds. Or some languages, you know, obligatorily they force you to represent specific aspects of a scene. For example, whether an action is ongoing or finished. You're forced to specify that in the verb. English has that too, but we're not right. forced to do it. So you can imagine if you're describing a picture in your head and you're then later asked to recall it, if you're forced to encode the whole process or the process and the end result, then that might be, you might remember different things about it. Yeah, that's way tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because those are the kind of things I run up all the time when I'm interviewing people is it just feels like there's this huge barrier of, you know, language and words and mm. and really getting to the core of, of being able to describe what's actually happening. Yeah. Right? You, right. you talk about the difference between is it actually absent or is it just silent, right? Mm, uh, yeah. <laughs> just that small sliver of difference. How do you describe that and figure that out just with yeah. a conversation, with speech, with words, language? It's very mm. difficult. Yeah. All right. Well, that is pretty much it. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I don't think so. I usually sort of try to emphasize that I don't think it's a disorder. It's just sometimes when I get interviewed, it feels like the interviewer thinks of it that way. That way, And right. I just always try to emphasize that I don't. Yeah, I don't either. I like the way Adam Zeman says it when he talks about aphantasia. He said, I don't think of it as a disorder at all. It's just a, an intriguing difference. Let me look at something else real quick. I think I may have a couple more questions for you about your own inner voice. Yeah, if you don't mind, just a couple uh, little questions here. Sure. So, so we've we've said the word or the phrase "inner voice" a lot today. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's interchangeable with "inner monologue," or would you say that's a different thing? I just use "inner speech" because it's what we we use in my research field. But there's tons of different ways of referring to it. I think it's all the same. Yes. Okay. Um, so you can call it "inner monologue" or "inner dialogue" or "inner speech" or in a voice or internal verbalizations, self-talk, all that right. stuff. Okay. So in your research with talking to a bunch of different people, do you feel like all of those phrases kind of mean the same thing to, to everybody or do they all have all kind of different interpretations of what that means? I think sometimes people who don't have inner speech, especially are a bit confused by the terms because they often report experiencing in a like soundless words or they, they think in language but they don't hear it and they don't they don't experience it as a voice they find the terms too vague i think and to properly describe their experience right. but once once i say like when i think about it i mean that you can identify what language it is for example or whose voice it is and that it sort of extends over time and you can feel the intonation and all that stuff then it gets easier for people to understand what i mean i think but mostly yeah. i think it's just a question of different research traditions 
Because what I've found a lot of times is a lot of these words and phrases mean something different to everybody because they, mm. it just means whatever's happening to them. And in so many cases, they have no idea that anybody is having a different experience. Mm. Right. Yeah. Because I had that, I had that same experience with the word imagination, you know, because a fantasia means without imagination. Mm. I was like, well, well, hold on. I have an imagination, <laughs> right? Like, because that word meant something different to me. Yeah. Because I've always been a very creative person and I write stories and poems. And so to me, that's what imagination was. Mm. But now that I have a different understanding and definition of what other people mean by that word, mm. then in that setting, yeah, I don't have one. But in my way, I do, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think that same thing kind of happens with inner monologue inner voice it, it means something a little bit different to everybody because we're all experiencing yeah. it a little bit differently yeah that's a good point and that's also why it's important to me when i talk to people that i explain what i mean <laughs> I, I, right. I almost always have to do that but this is the same with Aventasia. right it's important to, to define it in a certain way mm. yeah right. Okay, one last question. What does the phrase, I have a song stuck in my head, mean to you? I almost always have a song stuck in my head, actually. Whenever I think I don't have one, then I can just sort of listen a bit carefully, and then there's always one playing <laughs> somewhere at the back of my mind. And I can hear the singer's voice, if there is one, and I can hear the instruments, but I can't. I know some people can, like, remove one instrument or add one instrument or you know turn some of them up and some of them down and all of that stuff i can't do that okay <laughs> yeah so you can hear it pretty well but manipulating it is a whole different story yeah yeah for sure and it always mystifies me so much that if i go to sleep and i have one song stuck in my head it is still playing when i wake up oh really <laughs> it always makes me wonder like what well, has it just been playing the whole time when I've been playing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have no idea how that works. That is so funky. Would you say that overall it's a positive experience or a negative experience to have a song in your head? Ooh, positive, I would say. All right. So, I, so I, we also asked the people with no inner speech uh, in our experiments how often they had songs stuck in their head, actually. That was part of the big questionnaire, and they were much less likely to have that. Really? Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate your time. And that was very interesting mm. and a lot of cool things for me to, to think about and try to wrap my mind around. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And uh, good luck in your future research. And I look forward to hearing what else comes from it. Thanks. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, follow, and engage with us, and share it with your friends and family as we continue to explore this fascinating subject. For additional information about this episode or Shane's Brain, check out the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Discovering Your Mind podcast. You are beautifully unique.